and welcome to Krista Explains a Masterpiece. That's right, after literally a tiny handful of episodes, I have decided that my show already needs a spin-off show. And the spin-off show is this, Krista Explains a Masterpiece, where I'm going to go through a little bit of the history and the medium and the techniques that were originally used to create the masterpieces that I have been recreating. So let's get started with Girl with a Pearl Earring. Hmm, the very first painting that I recreated for Krista Paints a Masterpiece. Also, an extremely interesting painting from a historical perspective. It was known as well as Girl with a Turban, Head of a Girl, Girl Heady Turban Girl, Turban Turban Head Head, Head Girl Turban Girl. No, some of those are not true, but it was known by a variety of names before it was finally known as Girl with a Pearl Earring. Now, the painting was painted by Johannes Vermeer, as far as most people are concerned. We will get to that later. And we're all asking ourselves the question, who's the girl? <gasps> Which brings us neatly into what I feel like is going to be a theme for this series. Was it a romance? <sighs> Spoiler alert, most of the time it was not a romance. So, again, who was the girl with the pearl earring? The fact of the matter is, it's a mystery! In fact, no one knows. There was a movie made in 2003, I believe, uh, that was adapted from a book that theorised that girl with the pearl earring was a servant or milkmaid of Johannes Vermeer, who worked in his household and they had a bit of Colin Firth being very charming and Scar Jo being very sad and vulnerable and then there's some of that charming and then it's a vulnerable and Jules are nearly kissing, nearly ha <clears throat> But that's very unlikely as a matter of fact. It's probably much more likely that Girl with a Pearl Earring was a portrait of Johannes' eldest daughter Maria. Ah, that's nice! And the reason for this theory is because there are multiple portraits that are of Maria, and if you have a look, hmm, quite similar. Quite similar indeed. Now the thing that blasts a hole in that theory, unfortunately, is because Johannes Vermeer was not a great portrait artist. He was a great painter of people, in the sense that he captured a really cool vibe of what it was like to live in Amsterdam at that period of time and life and like windows and people doing knitting and all sorts of stuff. But as far as the portraits go, I mean we say this one is Maria and this is a girl with a pearl earring, you think yeah yeah they look quite similar but then all his ladies look quite similar. So it might have been Maria, might not have been Maria. If it was Maria, it should also be noted that Maria is potentially a painter of some of the other pictures that have been attributed to Johannes Vermeer. Mm, so she may have been a portrait painter in her own right. Imagine that! A woman getting missed out in history in favour of a man! <laughs> that never happens! <laughs> uh, but we do have an answer to the question, was it a romance? Thankfully, probably not, because if it was a romance, ew, father and daughter. And even if it was a romance between like, cool painter guy and vulnerable servant, this is probably just a very nice painting in the style of a trony, which is, slightly odd word and it's not the same as a troma which is the style of horror movie a trony is not a portrait so much as a painting of a head and the kind of theatrical element of her having more or less a turban and the earring that's quite characteristic of the old tronies now let's talk a little bit about the techniques and materials 
that Vermeer used to create this portrait. It's an oil painting and the pigments that would have been mixed with oil, probably linseed oil, potentially poppy oil, were ochres. So yellow ochre would have featured in there probably. There would have been some kind of light red, it's often called, and that's a reddish ochre. And there's also ultramarine blue, which if you've watched the other video or literally any of my videos, you will know is a color that I use all the time. What you may not know is ultramarine blue back in Vermeer's day was not a synthetic color as it is now. Ultramarine blue was crushed up lapis lazuli. And it was actually one of the most expensive pigments, if not the most expensive pigment that money could possibly buy. It was often used in religious paintings because it was so blimmin' expensive. You can actually still buy it today as a pigment, uh, but ultramarine blue synthesized is generally pretty blimmin' good. So most people just use that instead. The original painting also had a mossy green kind of background, but unfortunately, Vermeer was using fugitive pigments, and fugitive pigments are called fugitives <sighs> because they fade over time. And unfortunately, that's exactly what happened to the background. It faded from a very soft and subtle mossy green into black. And that's very sad. But it is also kind of interesting that there are paintings throughout all of history that have this evolution and this kind of timeline of changing. A lot of Caravaggio's paintings, and I will get to a Caravaggio at some stage, a lot of Caravaggio's paintings had fugitive reds in them, and the reds have now faded to dark brown or black, and consequently they are a lot more high contrast now than they may have been when they were originally painted. So it's an oil painting, it was painted on canvas, which is the same kind of canvas that we still use for paintings today. It would have been treated with some kind of uh, sizing or glue to prevent the oil from actually seeping into the fabric and destroying over time. So that might have been something like a rabbit skin glue. But scientists and restorers using microscopes and lasers have also managed to sort of look through the layers of the painting. And there are things, grounds underneath the actual oil, including bone and chalk and lead. So a lot of that stuff is creating a nice barrier. One last thing to talk about would be the eponymous pearl that is mentioned in the title. <gasps> it's probably not a pearl. <gasps> I know, mind blown, right? The girl with a pearl earring? It's not even a pearl? The reason why I say that, and the reason why it's not just me, other historians, like I'm a historian, the reason why historians say that is because, number one, look at the size of the flippin' thing! It's massive! Only rich people had pearls that big! There's no way Johannes Vermeer had a pearl just laying around that he was gonna pop on some girl and then paint to a picture! No way! So number one, it's too big to be a pearl. Number two, it's too shiny to be a pearl. Most of the time pearls have a slightly more matte sheen to them and they're usually white. This thing is super reflective. So quite a few historians believe that it may have actually either been a glass bead, which people used to use as fake pearls, or it could even be made out of tin or silver. It's reflective enough to be metallic it's too reflective probably to be a pearl. Whew, and that's it. I basically said everything that I wanted to say about Girl with a Pearl Earring. At the time that it was produced, it was sold for next to nothing to Gilders. I didn't even know Gilders were actually a form of currency. The only time I remember hearing them is in A Princess Bride, and I really honestly thought they were made up. But two Gilders does not sound like a lot of money, and I don't think it was at the time. But now it is considered to be a priceless masterwork. And I think so too. It's a very beautiful painting. You're a very beautiful audience. I will see you the next time I'm going to explain our masterpiece.